the machine that builds the machine is a very interesting topic when we think about the brain because uh, our mind is something that is uh, not uh, just designed as a technological system from the outside in, but as biological and social systems are from the inside out. If we look at this uh, difference, uh, when we design a system in our lab, we start from a deterministic environment and we take a substrate into this environment that is not structured yet in the way in which we want it to be structured, but we can fully control it. And we extend our determinism into this new part of the universe to basically extend our deterministic world into this particular thing. So we are coming from the outside in in technological design. And if you look at a biological system, you do not have this deterministic environment to start with. Instead, you have an indeterministic environment and you start out with some seed that needs to colonize the environment, to branch out, to subdue it, to turn it into something that the seed knows how to deal with. And then gradually turn its own structure. And when you go beyond uh, simple organic growth, you look at organismic growth, where you already know the structure around you because you have created it, or you are part of something that uh, had a shared destiny at some point. And so now you have known units around you with which you can collaborate and uh, organize. And so you are uh, colonizing the outside. And internally, you are organizing from uh, the ground up, from local units inside out. And uh, we can ask ourselves what an organism is. Does an organism actually exist, right? We sometimes think of organisms as things, but uh, the organism is a virtual thing. It's a function that describes a coherent pattern in the activity of many cells, right? So the individual cells are all serving that function and uh, by making them coherent due to evolutionary pressure and uh, the design constraints that, that are built into the cells as a result of that, you see a coherent pattern emerging. And this coherent pattern that we see emerging, that is the causal structure that we call the organism. And the organism, like every other thing that exists, to exist is to be implemented, is implemented to some extent. But it's not implemented in the way in which a, a computer chip is implemented, but uh, the degree of approximation is much more vague. And it's uh, the organism exists to the degree that the patterns in the interaction of the cells in the organism are coherent. So in some sense, we see a pattern of this organization, a software that emerges over this uh, information processing uh, that looks as if there is a coherent agent that is inhabiting this thing. And traditionally, the word for this uh, emergent operating system for an autonomous robot uh, in nature is called spirit. And so in this sense, uh, the emergent agency that we see in organisms is this actually what was called spirits by the previous civilization. And uh, these spirits also happen to be in our own minds, and they also happen to emerge in groups of people, nation states, and ecosystems, and so on. And these spirits are virtual machines that possess agency. That is, they play a controlling role while being able to model the future and their own part, uh, place in the universe to some degree, and they are approximately implemented. And uh, so in this sense, the spirit is a very uh, high level of an organization that is required to see the emergence of such a spirit. And uh, when we look at the hierarchy of causal systems at the lowest level, uh, we may have something like uh, our automata, like the game of life. And uh, the, uh, these automata, uh, they can already be Turing complete. It's not that they are limited in, in any way. But if you give them some memory and so on, they can impl implement arbitrarily complex structure if you set them up in the right way. But uh, you need to do this uh, from the outside where some kind of design process. Uh, the only automaton that might uh, be able to do this without it, um, or with a random starting state, is uh, our universe itself. That might be a big automaton at its bottom level, and we just happen to inhabit a region in it that has interesting enough complexity to contain us. If you look at a mechanism that is slightly more complicated than uh, causal, uh, that uh, than an automaton, that's usually a stateful thing, and it uh, is. Uh, entwined with a substrate. Uh, here I used as an example the um, famous uh, machines uh, by, um, sorry, uh, my, my brain is blanking out. Um, sorry, um, Tanya, do you know his name? 
uh, Theo Janssen, Theo Janssen Strand Beasts. And uh, he is, has been building these amazing machines that are driven usually by wind power. And they're completely mechanical things that are comp fully coupled with the environment that don't have an existence that is in the sense independent of the environment. And uh, if you look at um, feedback systems, you can have uh, open loop systems that are coupled. For instance, in oscillators you uh, and in synthesizers, you produce uh, interesting patterns that are the result of some static coupling. And if you make this coupling dynamic, uh, for instance, in the regulator for a steam engine, you uh, can have a cybernetic control system. And the controller in a cybernetic system is uh, built by uh, having a system that cares about the target value and uh, wants to minimize the distance to the target value. And uh, if you extend this controller uh, with computation, you can get an agent. And uh, to uh, have this decoupling of this ability to model the future, you need to have a system that is a computer. A Turing machine, in some sense, is a, uh, is a mechanism that is disentangling itself, decoupling a causal structure from the underlying dynamic of the universe. The interesting thing about our computers is that they do the same thing regardless of what the environment is doing. They work the same way, uh, whether you are carrying them to America and New York, or whether the temperature is a few degrees higher or lower, or whether you climb a mountain or uh, go uh, down, or whether the wind is blowing or not. And the same kind of computer also exists inside of our skulls. It's a slightly different one, but uh, the, this principle of the uh, computer is that enables an arbitrary causal structure. And you need to have this arbitrary causal structure to be able to make models of the future, right? Because you want to look at different futures, uh, you, uh, that regardless of what the universe is doing right now. And the simple system that we know in nature that is in the sense Turing complete and uh, has the powers of functional approximation uh, and self-organization uh, to achieve that is the cell. So the cell basically is able to perform computations that are decoupled from its uh, immediate substrate and that en enable the cell to make models that predict the future to, so the cell can regulate against future disturbances and keep itself stable against these disturbances. So and that's why the cell as such a complex system is able to exist. So the cell is an agent. And an agent is basically a controller combined with an internal set point generator and the ability to model the future. So the uh, agent is not just acting like a thermostat on the next frame and tries to optimize uh, the state of the next frame, but it's integrating the expected set point deviations over the future and tries to minimize them. And uh, if the modeling capacity is sufficient, then this uh, uh, agent is able to model different branches of the universe and the effect that its uh, decisions will have on, on these branches. And as a result, you basically get beliefs, desires, and intentions all emerging from a simple controller that is able to model the future. So this is basically a minimal concept of agency. And uh, agents can start to collaborate with each other. and. Um, as a groups uh, for agents and groups agents uh, will typically have uh, individual motivation and a reputation system among the agents that makes sure that their actions are harmonious and beneficial to the members of the group. And a uh, slightly different uh, extension of uh, the group agent is a state building agent. A state building agent is one that scales beyond a reputation system. It means that the individuals do not have to know each other individually to have to maintain a model of their reputation and that transaction and synchronize this reputation system somehow like a tribe does. A state is fundamentally different from the tribe because the members of the state become interchangeable. They have functional roles now. And uh, these uh, state building agents can grow very large. But uh, the uh, size of the state building agents depends on the size of the effective colonial structure that it can maintain. So basically the logistics chain to build such a colony of uh, units such as synchronized, the state needs to uh, have a way to impose administration on its substrate and extract more neg like, entropy from the substrate than the administration costs. And this limits the size of the design of a state building system, especially once you have such a state building system and evolution, it's going to compete with similar systems for the same like entropy. Right? So you are basically the set of principles that has outcompeted all other systems from extracting neck entropy from your volume of space. And uh, to do this, 
you need to impose uh, coordinated patterns of uh, organization onto your volume of space. And this, uh, because you are competing with others, limits the size that you can have. And there are very few organisms that have cracked the code and have become infinitely scaling state building agents, right? Most state building systems have a limited size. Their design is limited by the stable cha uh, logistics chain that they can use to impose their colony onto the environment. And this uh, here, for instance, is uh, the Pando forest. It's uh, ash trees in Utah. And it's one of the largest organisms that we have on earth. All these trees are the same tree. They're uh, not just genetic clones of each other, but their roots are connected. This is basically one big tree that can grow as large as it wants. It's very old and it didn't mutate very much since its growth, right? So it needs to be evolutionary stable so it doesn't drift. Another example for an infinitely scaling state building agent is uh, Lindipithema humile. It's a, um, a Brazilian uh, ant that uh, has spread around the world. And all members of this ant, uh, of these ant colonies, will not attack each other. They will all treat each other as part of the same cohesive colony. With the exception of a few uh, drifted colonies, for instance, in, in the US, um, when uh, they get in touch with uh, the other colonies, they will attack each other. So they had some kind of genetic drift after the colony was established that uh, makes uh, them appear to be strangers to each other. But this species has crack the problem of becoming infinitely scaling state. There's no limit to the size of this colony apparently. And if you look at the design constraints for such systems, so the mechanical component needs to have um, an outside in design by some external agent. So it is not going to exist by itself and it's not able to adapt by itself. And uh, when you build a controller, a uh, controller gets resilience that can be uh, larger than the mechanical component because it's able to adapt its states to a slightly changing environmental circumstances and maintain an attractor state by itself via dynamic control. And if uh, your controller is able to model the future uh, via decoupled computation, then it's able to integrate future reward and is able to uh, not just adapt itself to the environment, but it's also able to adapt the environment to itself. And uh, in a uh, group agent, you can do this on the next level. So you basically build an agent that is composed of multiple sub-agents. And each of these sub-agents has its individual mo uh, motivation and a reputation system to coordinate the group. And in a state building agent, you uh, uh, change this reputation system or extend it via hierarchical governance. And this thing needs an immune system. So the individuals are submitting to this governance and are not building their own government that is competing with the main government. And uh, you will have limited autonomy of the sub agents. So they will be set up in such a way that they, per default, most of them will want to submit to the state building group rather than doing their own thing. And uh, you can see this uh, in, in humans. Uh, we are basically a domesticated species uh, of uh, the hominids. And uh, as a result, you're not just tribal. Homo sapiens is state building because the, um, most of the individuals in, uh, in our species are willing to submit to the group before they do their own thing. And uh, if you go to an infinitely scalable state building agent, you can do uh, at some level less than you can do in, in these other groups because uh, the, you need to be static. You cannot have an evolutionary drift. You cannot adapt to the environment beyond uh, the mechanisms that are built into the system. Because if you were to drift, then this, uh, this uh, infinite scale would break and you would no longer be consistent. So uh, if you think of uh, hierarchical governance as a principle, we have a trade-off there but, uh, between adaptivity and coherence in the system. The uh, more adaptive it is, the harder it is to maintain coherence. And the individual agents here are incentivized to defect from the system uh, very often. And you might have to limit this by having an agent that imposes an offset to the payoff matrix to the individuals. And this is what we call a government. And uh, the need for a government uh, comes not from political constraints or from the desire to exploit people or something else. It's just a game theoretic thing that you can uh, derive from first principles. And uh, the purpose of this government is to integrate the total reward, which can happen from bottom up, and to top down do credit assignment to make sure that uh, the individual behavior is adjusted in such a way that uh, the Nash equilibria of the individual agents become compatible 
with the common good. And this is something that also needs to happen in some sense in our own brain. The neurons are autonomous reinforcement learners. And the interaction between uh, the neurons needs to be coordinated into a coherent structure. And uh, Jerry Edelman has suggested that the organization that happens in our own mind uh, is uh, something that evolves in every individual in some kind of what he calls uh, evolution, he calls neural Darwinism. And uh, so maybe uh, the top-down process that is harmonizing our bottom-up perception is something like a, a governance, a colonizing agent. So our brain is not just playing free jazz, which it does to some extent, but it also plays a, a coordinated symphony. It is serving coherent goals. It is uh, has an emergent coherent agent that is uh, forming inside the organization of the cells and makes our organism more efficient by giving it coordinated spirit. So how is this relevant to AI? Current machine learning uh, representations all have an outside-in design. And in organisms, the uh, representations are different. The organisms are coupled to the environment, so the features are not static. They are functions that basically are operators on your current mental representation to give you the next state. And they're tuned in such a way that they track the sensory patterns. And the features are kept stable and coordinated via individual controllers. So every feature is probably some control structure that maintains its stability and its coordination with the environment. And the entire thing get, goes beyond jazz by having some kind of emergent governance that harmonizes it and instantiates individual features and resolves them and they're no longer necessary, destroys the attractor states uh, with uh, some governance when at the level of the scene that you currently use to interpret the world. And uh, you have multiple systems of interacting agency in there. Within the scene agent that is trying to predict how the world continues, you also have a self-agent that is uh, driven by the motivation of uh, our uh, organism. And uh, you have an attention agent that is figuring out which fe uh, features to select and harmonize and to instantiate and to dissolve at any given moment. And in this way, organisms can have a centralized causal structure but the centralized causal structure is not like a CPU in a computer, rather it's, an, uh, it's more like the centralized causal structure in a society of people that emerges uh, as a result of an evolution that makes the society more efficient and better at competing with other societies. So um, this is where I end for today. Thank you, Yosha.